Hello, I'm Frank Epstein, founder and president of Collage New Music. It is my pleasure to introduce you to our latest online presentation entitled The Composer Speaks. The Composer Speaks is an opportunity to introduce composers directly to you. Augusta Reed Thomas was born in New York City in 1964. She is currently serving as head of composition at the University of Chicago. A longtime resident composer with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, she worked closely with the conductors there, including Daniel Berenbaum, Mrs. Love Rostropovich, Pierre Boulez, Christoph Eschenbach, Essa Pekka Salonen, Lauren Mazel, Seiji Ozawa, and Oliver Nussen. And it was here that she founded the Composer Now series. She is a recipient of numerous prizes, in fact, too numerous to list here. Gusty, as she likes to be called, is a rather unique individual. Totally fun, verbally skilled, with great insights into composition, if not life itself. And she's businesslike all at once. The consequence of all that is that her music glistens with a sense of perfection, deep thought, and continuous refinement. While at the same time, her music sounds completely spontaneous. Her sense of creativity is closely aligned with thorough compositional skill and hard work. She loves composing. It represents who she is first and foremost. Thinking about her own music, she says, quote, I love composing and outcomes are unpredictable. Everything is flexible and malleable, springy, stretchy, colorable, twistable, bouncing, zigzagging, and splinterable. It feels like I'm dancing with contrapuntal sonic lights. And she goes on and on and on. She has written for all sorts of groupings, including in more recent years, a number of works for percussion, one of which is orchestrated for as many bells as the percussionist can locate, from the smallest handbell to gigantic church bells. Her personality bubbles with compositional enthusiasm and wisdom, having composed so many pieces. What the future holds for Gusty would be fun to know, and time will tell. It is now my pleasure to introduce music director David Hoos, who will lead our discussion with Augusta Reed Thomas. We thank you all for joining us, and we hope this experience will bring you closer to new music and the composers that write it. Good afternoon, Gusty. It's a pleasure to see you. You look very sunny, uh, bright. The, the sun is shining in Chicago, and as the sun is often shining from you. Um, I'm so pleased you're here to talk with me about you and your music and your, your life. Well, let, I just would like to say thank you so much, David, for including me it means a lot to me, and I also would like to thank Frank Epstein for his long-standing leadership and hard work and all the musicians and your whole team. I, I really appreciate being part of this. Well, this whole, the whole idea of the interviews with composers now, maybe 10 or 12 composers, I'm not sure, was Frank's idea. So I'm very pleased that he... I was reluctant at first, I have to say, um, but... I'm, I've enjoyed them a lot, and I'm sure I'll enjoy this one as well. A couple of weeks ago, I was speaking, as you know, I was speaking to Bernard Ranz, your wonderful husband and wonderful composer, 
and he described a very different lifestyle for you than for him, and that is that you're up at 4 a.m. having coffee, maybe eating something, I don't know, and you're you're busy at work by 4.30 a.m. What were you doing this morning? What were you working on at 4.30? Oh, thank you for asking. Yeah, I do get up early. It's nothing uh, extra special. It's just that I wake up and my mind is like alive and I just, so I jump out of bed and I, I like my early mornings. I like to watch the sunrise. And this morning I was working on an orchestral piece commissioned by the BBC Proms, which premieres August 8th, which is like tomorrow practically. So I was working on that piece and uh, feel very lucky to have that opportunity and to have the time this morning to be working on it. Where are you in that process of this? How long a piece is it going to be? And where are you in the beginning, the middle, the end? Um, are you are you editing? What what's going on? Oh, thanks for asking. Yeah, it's basically the piece is due. I have to finish it in the next two weeks or so. So I'm sort of at the end. But I'm a perfectionist, so you know I, I'm constantly tweaking and polishing and you know, shaving and, and thinking about every little last tiny intricate detail. So I'm kind of in that phase. And, so when, uh, oh, go ahead. when you say you're toward the end, does that mean you have put on a double bar that ends it and now you're going back and revising and, and tweaking things? Or have you not gotten to the double bar? Nope, you're just right. I've, I have reached the double bar. The piece is there. Yay. And, you know, now it's a, I'm thinking about, you know, pacing and flow. Like, is that chord long enough for its de the, the harmonic rhythm? Or, you know, maybe it should be a beat longer. Or maybe there should be a lift, you know, just before the next object. Or, uh, you know, just little, tiny little things like that. Or I wonder if the, the G sharp, which is the common tone, is loud enough in the second French horn and you know lots of like teeny weeny little details but they're to me critical because uh, I feel that all of the parameters of music are allied together you, you can't separate harmony from harmonic rhythm from counterpoint from pitch from density from flow from empathy with the musicians et cetera, and so forth so you know one little change here is is like a three-dimensional crossword puzzle all of a sudden, you have to make sure that it's just right for all the other parameters that you're working with. I think of you as somebody who is holding a lot of stuff in her head and her mind all the time. Um, but I wonder if you, if there is one uh, parameter in your music that you tend to revise. Is it pacing, balance, color, um, dynamics, of course, tied to balance, but not not always, um, or or pitches even, uh, registers, that kinds of thing. Is there something that if we said, well, she tends to make this kind of revision, it would be. Your question about revision is really interesting, and I have to say it's changed over the years. When. I was a little girl, I started writing music like a million years ago, and so on and so forth. So I wrote an enormous amount of horrible pieces, like terrible, like this one's bad, that one's worse, this one's even worse, that one didn't work, the form didn't work here, the this didn't work there, ching, 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 you know, do that for like years, boom, 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 boom. And so I did revise a lot, you know, this could have been better, this doesn't work, that little thing right there, that had potential, but I didn't do anything with it, or whatever it might be. So there was periods in my life um, where I was doing lots of revision and lots of throwing out of material. I think because I've been really focused every single day on writing music now for over 40 years, and I mean like every day I'm working at it, hopefully one gets just a little teeny bit better, you know, a little bit as time goes by. And so I'm doing a lot less revision. Like, I, I, I know what the piece is about, I know what I'm building, I'm building it, and I, I make it. And so it's just very different, but I have to put that in the context of uh, making a lot of revisions when I was younger. What was that music like when you were a kid? And I don't mean, oh, it was terrible, or it was okay, or my parents loved it. 
but what was it like if we heard it what would we what would we think it was was it proto mozart or was it uh, was it in some other completely different language yeah so when i was a little girl we had a piano in the house and i'm the 10th of 10 children and i used to lie underneath the piano and hear all the sounds come around me when i was like 3 my mom supported the family she taught kindergarten and she was an amateur pianist and I remember being so attracted to the piano. And so I would like reach up and go like, plink, you know, and to me, that was a whole song. It was like Jaybird song, plink or something. And then I would make up a chord and call it a song or something. So, I mean, that, that's what it, it was. It was like nothing. It was exactly zero. But I, I started to write. And then through my mother's school, I was able to take piano lessons, which was a huge privilege uh, because I was so attracted to music. And I started to learn how to play piano, and I played for many, many years, of course, taking lessons and so forth. But um, at that point, my piano teacher was like, well, why don't you make up another one for next week and another one? And so I was just making these things up. And then in sort of seventh, eighth, and ninth grade, I had a very good band teacher who also gave me composition lessons. And I think the first piece I wrote was in F minor, <laughs> when like eighth it's a, grade. It's a good key. It's a good key, yeah. and it was probably four minutes long, and it, it was horrible. But um, yeah, you know, but but, but what was it? Not oh, not... it was a piece for two trumpet solos and the entire band at my school. So it was a big, huge piece for a seventh or eighth or ninth grader. I don't remember how old I was. A big, huge thing to do, um, and you know, it was, it was just fun. And of course, I was writing smaller pieces too. And I've just always enjoyed it. I mean playing piano as a young artist, and then I took up the trumpet in third grade. And most people don't know this, but I was a trumpet performance major in college, not a composer. So, 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 much, so many tendrils I would like to touch on, but let's be honest, the trumpet is not in, an instrument that a lot of girls picked up. So how did you end up playing the trumpet instead of the clarinet or... Even the even the horn. So it's a really funny story. In second grade, I remember my mom saved it. That's why I remember the report card. You need to get these little report cards. The music teacher wrote, this child should go into music. Because I was just so into music, even in second grade. So then third grade, we get to pick our instrument to be in band. And so they lined us up down the hall alphabetically. And my last name is Thomas. So when I got into the room to pick my instrument, they had euphonium, snare drum, or trumpet. Uh -huh. And I remember I came home with my trumpet, and my mother was like, but I thought you wanted to play you know, flute or clarinet or something. And I said, I did, but they, they ran out of those. And then my mom was like, well, you should have been first, because you're the one student who's so into music. I was like, OK, well, I like the trumpet. So I literally just practiced like crazy. My goal was to be in the Chicago Symphony as a trumpet player. So I was practicing all state. Uh, you know, orchestra, chamber orchestra, jazz band, band, brass quintet, the, the whole, the whole package. And um, but all through that, I was also singing in chorus and playing guitar at home, which I'm a terrible guitar player. But I would like play Simon and Garfunkel songs and sing along with them and things like that. <laughs> and then, um, you know, also uh, doing all of these other musical activities and also composing. So it, it, it's like a whole life of making music as a one-on-one -on -one with me and the piano and then me in a chorus and then in a band and then in a chamber group. And I think all of that uh, constellation of musical activity for so many years as a young artist really informs everything that I've continued to do. When's the last time you played the trumpet? Quite a long time ago, although recently there was one hanging around, and I, you know, <laughs> I was just buzzing into it. It sounded sounded just ridiculous. But it's interesting because, like, I know how to play it. I really know how to play trumpet. Like, I really know, but I couldn't play it because I my lips just weren't in shape. Yeah, it's so not... it was this really weird feeling of like, wait, it's like riding a bicycle. I know how to do this, but then you know you got to stay in shape. Yeah. So, Mr. Hurstus, of course, was your hero. Yes. Well, the whole CSO is just... Yeah. Uh, I mean, they're just fantastic. Some 
things that are characteristic of really all of my music. For instance, I love harmony. I love, you know, building these chords and, you know, dominant seventh, ninth, eleventh, fourteenth, you know, drop out the root, respace it, and, you know, I spend hours at the piano right here behind me, you know, making up chords and things. Another thing that's very central, I think, to all of my work is a sense of rhythmic animation. I like uh, rhythm. I just, I've been playing music my entire life, and I, I like to imagine all kinds of different rhythmic syntaxes. So, in a piece of mine, you might have a certain rhythmic syntax that might be kind of mixed meter, you know, you know, something like that. And then you might also have another section where it's like floating, you know, you know, something like this. So these are two completely different rhythmic syntaxes and, and then uh, feeling their energies and then how to have them exist in the same piece or move from one to the other or cross cut from one to the other, so, something like that. So that's another thing that really comes up in all of my work. And of course, I love timbre and color and so forth. Um, you were asking about revision. One of the things that's interesting to me, uh, just a random thing, but it I, for some reason that I don't completely understand, and I'm sure it's true for lots of people, but I just have really, really, really clear pitch. Like if you play a wrong note, I'm going to hear it. And I don't even want to hear it. I don't even mean to hear it. It's just the way my ears work, the way my brain is. I, uh, pitch is just like blazing at me. And so, uh, you know, like the difference between in a chord, the G sharp or the A. It's like a thousand miles away and it's like almost the same chord. But to me, it's a million miles away because I'm, I'm hearing the different beating and, and things like that. So the revisions you're making, I'm sorry to get stuck on this, but the revisions you're making in the orchestra piece you're working on now for the proms are one thing. But you look back at that 20 year old piece and you say, oh, that transition or why isn't there a transition or why did I make whatever the musical decision was? Are you ever tempted to, to rework it? Yeah, with, with the piece I'm writing right now for the proms, just to clarify, I wouldn't call what I'm doing revising. I would call it polishing. Well, yeah, I, I, that's fa fair, fair you correction. Know, it's really about um, all the details because I, I read a lot of poetry and I love poems and you, you have this one line and then if you change two words, the whole meaning changes and it has to be a dash or is it a colon or is it a semicolon or is it a capital letter or if we change the lines or what, whatever, all of these like incredibly beautiful things that poems can do. And someone said something really interesting to me recently about how if the poem is 12 lines or something like that, it might take you four pages to write an essay about what the poem is saying. But the poem can say it in just the 12 lines. And so that sense of precision, is it a dash or is it a semicolon? And if I do that, how does it change the, the, the flow or something like that? Uh, so in, in the biggest sense, and this is going to sound really weird, I think, but I think I'm a poet composer and not a novelist. Now, that's not to say I don't write long works. But it, it's this polishing of every last little tiny itty bitty thing that I do, even in, in the long works, that reminds me of kind of the craft of poetry and the specificity. Um, so when you talk about revising or polishing, um, the, to there me is a kind, difference. Yeah. Yes. But back to the 20 year old piece, yeah, whose transition so, you don't like. Right. So the pieces that are with G. Shermer, I have not revised, for better or worse. <laughs> but um, they're there. They exist partly because I want to move forward in life. And if, it's a little bit because my works are made so organically, what happens is if I change one thing, then that means the other thing has to change. And then that was connected to this, which was connected to that. And those three things were connected to those six things. And those came from here. It's like a sweater unravels. You know, you change one thing and all of a sudden the entire scarf is just a pile of wool on the floor. Uh, it, it's, I, I, don't, I don't like Band-Aids. Like, okay, well, I'll just fix this little thing with a Band-Aid because I can hear the Band-Aids. Uh, I, I want it to be this organic 
thing that has its own inner life, its own meaning, its own way of being. And so if I look back at it 25 years later, I'm like, oh, I could have you know, held that note a little longer or something. I, I just leave it alone. Um, and also I'm, you know, generally speaking, quite actively writing. So I've always got a lot to do sort of going forward. Oh, I throw things out every day, lots of things. Uh, I throw out way more than I keep. Um, so a huge part of my process, or the part of my process, or m let me start that over. My process is improvisatory. I improvise. I sit at the piano, I sing, I dance, I scat. I, when I go get my second cup of coffee, I'm actually walking to like the rhythmic thing I'm doing or trying to feel um, how much time does that particular thing need in its context? Does it work in context? Um, so I, I would be constantly revising all, all, all day long. I mean, um, it, it could be something, uh, I'm thinking of something more complicated, but it could be something like, is it, um, or is it, or is it, buddy, bum, you know, whatever. Like these are really similar, but they're like completely different. So I will spend like all day, you know, figuring that out. And then finally I'll be like, okay, this is the one that it is. Or I'll be like, oh, that's, a, that's the stupidest thing I could have ever thought of. Throw the whole project out, start over. So I'm constantly, literally almost every minute thinking, okay, like where's it, where could it go? It's, it's like I'm making the music live. Uh, like at note by note, phrase by phrase, uh, color by color. It's not a, like uh, some external process. Like, okay, now I'm going to have these rules and then the rules will tell me what to do next. I'm actually just singing, essentially, singing and dancing. Yeah. So Peter Child, who was the first composer whom I interviewed in this series, said that like you, he throws out tons of stuff. Yeah. Um, but he also said that some of that stuff he throws out reappears. Maybe a year or two years later, he has notebooks and notebooks, and some of those ideas find a place. And is that your experience? Or if you throw them out, are they gone? Because you know, they, they, is it mainly, I guess what I'm asking is, did they not work here in this moment? Or do they, are they simply dumb ideas? That's a, a great question, and Peter Child is such a great guy and a great composer, <laughs> an amazing, amazing person, and I totally respect his work. And yeah, I mean, when I, uh, like, let's say I'm making something up, it's on the fly, you know, so I'm not, I'm not necessarily writing it down. I'm singing it or playing it. So it can evaporate, it can just disappear because it's like, oh, that was no good, this isn't good, that's stupid. This, you know, I'm, I'm not kind of writing them down. But to Peter's point, if you do sort of get a thing and you sort of write down whatever it is, 48 bars or something, you know, and it's sort of a thing and it's got some potential to it, but it's just not right for that piece, sometimes you get attached to the thing. You're like, oh, that's fascinating. I wonder what that could be. It's not right for this. It doesn't fit here, but maybe there's some potential. And then um, usually I don't use those just because everything is so organic and piece specific. But the process of making those and then throwing them out and going through the, this isn't good enough or it's not quite right is deeply valuable. So, some chamber group has uh, asked you to write a piece for combination of instruments, it almost doesn't matter what it is. Do you ever dread writing the piece? So, to be honest, David, I love music so much. I just love music. I love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. It's my whole life. I've been a totally addicted to music, I think, since I was like three. 
and I've done it every single day of my life, making music, talking about music, listening to music, teaching music, supporting other people's music, you know, serving on boards that support music, you know, making festivals, running festivals, building centers, building, fest, you know, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's like music, 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 all day long, every day for my whole life. So I never dread anything <laughs> to do with music. I never dread it. Like, it's just fun. And so, I mean, when you, you refer to a, a chamber group commissioning something, I want to know who am I writing for? Can I hear them? Can I get to know the player a little bit? Can I hear how they play? Or what, you know, what, what they played in the past? Or what their recordings sound like? I try to get my head really into the vibe of that group, those people, what they are about and what they want. You know, they want a short piece or they want a, you know, a really substantial piece or what what are they thinking? What else is on the program? And really kind of place myself in the whole aura and atmosphere and essence of that that I'm making. And I mean, I love players. They're like my favorite thing because I mean, I was a player my entire life. And so I'm very empathetic to players. What What does it feel like to play this note? What is it? Can you hear why you're doing that crescendo? What, why, does, why did she mark down bow? I can feel that. I know it. I can feel that. Th that kind of thing, you know, to have an enormous empathy with the player. And what do the parts look like? And are they fun to play? And things of that kind. So, or maybe not even fun. Fun is one thing, but also, you know, rich or, or meaningful or um, uh, worthwhile. What, whatever the uh, opportunity is in a particular piece at a particular phrase or moment. So, yeah, I just love writing music, and I, I mean, there's certain things that I think would be hard, and I might go back to a chamber group and say, could we, you know, add an instrument, or could we maybe I, I take this instrument away and replace it with that one or something, but that's very normal, um, just in terms of, for instance, if you're, if you have harmonic ideas, and it's a piece for two people who play single notes, you know, you might say, can I add the harp? or something like that. One of the composers whom we interviewed, uh, wh whom you and I both know, said that he's often asked to write pieces for that so-called Piero plus percussion ensemble, the kind of ubiquitous ensemble of the 20th century. And he, and he said, I'm not sure I have another piece in me for that ensemble. Mm -hmm. um, that's probably not something that anyone would ever say about writing another string quartet, but I wonder whether there is any part of you that says, I'm picking up on what you said about, well, can we add the harp? Um, is there anything, any kind of ensemble that you, you find um, challenging to think about composing a work for? The Woodwind Quintet. The yeah. string trio, um, the Piero plus percussion ensemble. I think of three ensembles that can be challenging. When I'm asked to write a piece for whatever ensemble, whether it's Woodwind Quintet or Piero or uh, some of the other ensembles you mentioned, what interests me is building material for that piece. Like, really, it's what is the material? If you're writing a piece for the Berlin Philharmonic, you need one kind of material. If you're writing a piece for Girls Chorus, you need a different kind of material. If you're writing a piece for solo piano, it's yet different material. So if somebody comes to me and says, will you write a piece that's six minutes long for this combo, I right away I start thinking, okay, what is the material for that? It's only six minutes. You know, you can't throw everything into this piece. What is this piece about? Or, and what are these instruments? Or, um... You know, how could I make something that will work for that? And so I do spend so much time crafting the material. And therefore, if somebody asks me to write for an ensemble, I, I get excited because I'm like, oh, I could do this. I could do that. This could work. That would be interesting. I wonder how that would work. And before I know it, I'm like, you know, I have a thousand ideas already, that kind of thing. So, you know, and then I, as I said, I throw, you know, almost all of them away, but, um, you know, I get excited about the, the prospect of, of writing things. I think, you know, there are certain ensembles that are hard and certain solo instruments that are hard, but even those entice me. 
What are those challenging instruments? Well, I mean, I mean we, we, you know, we know Gunther Schuller, you know, wrote uh, Contrabassoon Concerto, and you think, oh my gosh, how could you do that? And, you know, there are tuba concertos, of course, and certainly certain other instruments that we don't necessarily think of as soloistic, but perhaps they yearn for, a, you know, a solo piece. Um, but I'm wondering what are, are, for you, the challenging instruments? They're all lovable in their own ways. Yeah, I mean... I love the bassoon. I think it's absolutely gorgeous. Just and the high bassoon and the low bassoon and the character of the bassoon and all that. It's just gorgeous. But to write a solo bassoon piece, it would be like, wow, okay, <laughs> you know, I really got to think about this. And what what can I make for that? And then I would get excited. Or um, you know, solo marimba because you only have like two mallets or four mallets. And it's pretty much a uniform timbre generally. It's wood. I mean, the lower bars ring further than the, the high, more brittle bars, but, and you, you, you can't move, the piano, you can go, you can't do that on a marimba, because your arms are going like this, like, you know, from the sharp side to the, uh, uh, the white note keys to the black note keys, to, to, just to say it that way, you know, you, you'd have like this, and like, it's quite long, the marimba, how to reach it, and so forth, so it's just tricky, you have to have really good material if you're going to write a piece for solo marimba that's playable and also where you can hold the four mallets but not always use them and you know so it just becomes like really a technical thing and then you have to build something that works so these are challenging but they're exciting i you know i, I i'm always up for the challenge actually so maybe it should be a bassoon and marimba duet so that would be easier for yes, i don't know why that would be easier well it seems it, like it would be easier. The ideas would come more more fluently, I would think. Yeah, and just the, the two different timbres, and then, you know, the bassoon has such a range of timbre, and so so on. But, um, yeah, I mean, there's... I pretty much am up for writing for any sounding object. <laughs> I know, I know, I mean, I don't want to... Uh, I, I mean, I typically... I write for instruments and people who've practiced them for many, many years typically and so forth. But there are a lot of people that, that write for other kind of sounding objects and I respect that. Okay, this, this conversation has been absolutely delightful. I want to end with uh, going way back to 4.30 this morning when you were drinking your first cup of coffee and, and working on your orchestra piece for the proms. Tell us what that piece is. The BBC proms asked me to make a piece that's about 13 minutes long. I think it will be an opener, although I'm not positive where they'll place it on the concert because with COVID and I'm using percussion, it might end up getting put in a different slot on the concert. And it is very dance-like. It's a little bit like Stravinsky crossed with bebop, a little bit, something, something along those lines, very rhythmic. Uh, a sense of mixed meter feel. You, you know, you could you could definitely dance to this piece. Colorful, energized, um, with different episodes inside of it. It, it has a very clear shape, a clear um, narrative, for lack of a better word. One thing progressing or leading to the next, and then leading to the next, and arriving there, and so forth. Um, all of my works go from left to right. I compose from left to right, like time. And uh, so there, there's, as I said, there's like this organic unfolding of the one thing leads to the next. And um, uh, I, I, at a certain point, I feel that the piece is writing me because the piece has a life of its own. If I'm willing to listen to it and go with it and feel where it wants to go, where does that phrase want to go? Or, Oh, this, this, we need this or something. If I can listen to it and feel it and go with it, I feel like it's writing me, even though I'm writing it. It's this bizarre kind of back and forth. Um, but
but I'm always writing by ear. Like I hear everything I write. For better or worse, you may like my music or you don't like my music, but um, you can hear that I heard it in that sense. I mean, it's just, uh, so um, yeah, that, that's what the piece is like. And it's a fun spirited piece. So and, uh, when they, when they uh, asked you to write this piece, they said, around 13 minutes, what else did they ask for? They, they, well, in this Besides moment, Besides have it done by this certain date. <laughs> in this moment of COVID, there's concerns about um, distancing of the musicians. And also, you know, can there be a piano and percussion and harp, or is that going to be too crowded on the stage? Mm -hmm. So the, some of the discussions were really about keeping people safe, which is great. That's what it should be. And so um, that was the major, you know, here's the duration and write a piece, but just keep this in mind. And because of COVID, even though the Royal Albert Hall is massive, <laughs> the orchestra has decided they're only going to have um, eight firsts, seven second violins, et cetera. So, so a much smaller string complement, and each string player will have their own part on their own stand. You know, so things like that that are a little different from, from normal. Typically in the Royal Albert Hall, you would want 16 first violins and, you know, a bigger sound because it's, a, it's sure. a massive, massive space. But just, just little things like that. But nothing, um, nothing bothered me about any of that. I mean, I was just super excited to be able to, to make the piece. And they didn't say, uh, this is going to be a concert opener. Sounds like they didn't tell you that. Um, they didn't say, we want a particular character or anything of that sort they simply you were talking about the nuts and bolts the length the timing of when it would be done the materials and the instrumentation and but beyond that free reign free reign and uh, so i suppose i could write a very slow movement and then that wouldn't be an opener or maybe mm -hmm. it's a closer or maybe it is an opener i don't know but very <laughs> Oh, this particular piece, it's, um, it's a very animated and um, it was super fun to create. And I, I love the, the process every day, getting up and having a project. And, you know, if I don't have a project, I get nervous. So for instance, if I finish a piece, about 12 minutes later, I start the next piece. And it, I know that sounds psychotic, and it probably is like, crazy, but that's just the way I am. I have to have a project. Like, okay, now I'm onto this one. And sometimes my husband will say, like, Gusty, like, you want to take a day off? Or you, you want to have lunch? <laughs> you know, or maybe you should, you know, stop for a minute. But it just, I just can't help myself. I'm, I am quite, I guess I'm addicted to music and I like to have uh, the next project going because my mind is always thinking about it. And so, yeah, that's just the, the way it is. And once I finish a piece um, and I feel that it's finished, I, I sort of automatically turn into the next one. Mm -hmm. Well, would that all of us could inherit a percentage of your enthusiasm and your, <laughs> your vigor and uh, that's clearly demonstrated in our conversation and in really everything I've ever known about you. Um, thank you so much for this time. So delight to see you, delight to see you at, I think, exactly the same place I saw Bernard, although he didn't have beautiful flowers behind him. So you have, you have gussied oh. it up a little bit. No, and I, the think hat, he, I think, I think, I think the hat. flowers, I think the flowers were there because that's Oh, where were they? they? Uh, um, maybe it's maybe your, he's... it's the combination of the hat and the flowers. So I wore the hat because I watched the other collage composer speaks videos, which I loved. And I noticed that uh, John Heiss and Davey Rakowski both wore hats. And uh, those are two composers I super admire. I know Davey really well. So I thought, all right, if Davey wore a hat and John wore a hat, then there's a tradition. So Excellent. I'm the third collage composer ball cap, but mine is more like full of like, I don't know, designs or something. So anyway, uh, thank you so much for having me. And again, thanks to Frank Epstein and, and your whole team, your board, and everybody who makes this possible. And Jacob for all of this uh, editing that he does. 
Thank you so much. I hope you stay well and safe. Give my love to Bernard. And um, I will hope to that we make contact soon and that there will be a way for us to hear your upcoming orchestra piece that is called Dance Foldings. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Such a pleasure. Thank you. Augusta Reed Thomas composed her Passion Prayers in 1999. This sweeping and luminous nine-minute work is cast as a mini cello concerto with flute, clarinet, violin, piano, harp, and percussion completing the ensemble. In this performance by Collage New Music, Joel Merschel, for many years the ensemble's esteemed cellist, was the soloist.